So where's the hemp growers in the room here? Who grows hemp? Couple. Nobody else has a basement. It's okay now. You won't get in trouble. Well, by the end of this presentation, I hope to convince all of you to be hemp growers, especially the farmers in the room, not just the agronomists and other people. But I know there was a couple of young farmers out there, and I'm going to convince you to grow hemp, I think. Uh, I think a lot of the other growers are at, uh, there's a hemp meeting going on today as well. Uh, so, am I live there? Yeah, so the hempening. I, I thought of this title way earlier because I thought it was fun, but then I saw a Shamus presentation, so I threw a picture of her and her uh, husband in there uh, just for, for kudos on the kind of theme idea. If anybody's seen this movie, I haven't, but I'm going to, a little bit of spoiler alert here. What happens is a whole bunch of people in these cities start mysteriously dying and they're trying to figure out why. And then they find out there's some sort of biotoxin being released by these specific plants and they don't know why and is it overpopulation and other things and uh, I'll kind of leave it at that. And so, you know, if there was one plant capable of something so amazing, I'd have to say it's more than likely going to be hemp. Uh, so we're talking industrial hemp here today. Uh, you know, just for the YouTube moderators in the future and other stuff, industrial hemp is less than 0.3% THC. It kind of gives you those, THC does that to you. CBD kind of does this. It could vary anywhere. A lot of the research on CBD is still uh, pretty protective, really. I think anybody who's in that industry and in that space doesn't want to give away those trade secrets. And, and we've unfortunately been pretty unsuccessful in uh, applying for funding to do work in CBD in relation to timing, redding, harvest, and things like that. So, yeah, I'm going to give you kind of like a 10-year recap of how long we've been growing hemp. So, that's a picture of me when my bike was still new and before, you know, I started losing my hair on the top of the head and putting it on the bottom of my head. So, this was kind of our hemp guru, Yan, when we first started growing hemp, and he told us all the things we needed to know. So I'm going to kind of do like a Jeff Butler here. We're going to go through these things, see how many were true then and how many we still think are true now. So first thing he said was maybe just put some edge down and cultivate to prep. Um, seed it after the May long weekend. Don't even worry about your seeding dates and stuff. It's not going to need a lot of fertilizer. Uh, there aren't really any herbicides, so don't worry about that. It'll outcompete any of the weeds on its own. Uh, there's not any pest problems, so you don't got to worry about insecticides and fungicides. And uh, it's a double threat crop. We've got hemp for fiber and hemp for food. And those were kind of the two main things that we studied in our variety trials and things like that. So this is a summary of the, the second kind of set of things we did. We started with a variety trial and kind of just worked our way into growing hemp. This is the second kind of th uh, thing we did. So we looked at hemp agronomy. So we started looking more at the varieties and how important a critical, or how critical your variety selection is for your end use, as well as for your management and logistics. Uh, we also looked at seeding dates, and we found, you know, in southern Alberta, we actually had better uh, grain yields on our earlier dates, more often than not. Um, that the talk about, you know, not worrying about to seed after May long, or seeding in June, or even later in June, uh, it didn't hold as true for us, I don't think. And then nitrogen fertility. And what we saw in nitrogen fertility was hemp doesn't really need a whole lot of fertility to do things, but it sure responds to it. And about 80% of that goes into the biomass. And so if you're growing for fiber and you put some N on it, you're going to get a lot of biomass. And about 20% of that goes to grain. And we can see some pretty cool results from that as well. So I wanted to kind of focus, because we've looked at a lot of this data in our tours and other things, and so I wanted to focus on kind of the differences in the regionality. So we've been growing hemp uh, with Sarda, with Inotech, and down in southern Alberta. And so what are some of the differences? Well, they got this thing called the Northern Advantage, and that's the reason why they're looking at uh, fiber, fiber biomass up there. They've got, okay, I'll keep going, Middle Earth, um, these are, Inotech's been growing it, I think, the longest of all of us. They're really consistent. Um, they don't have the, the craziness and swings in as much in daylight and other things. And so uh, we'll see, I kind of think they're the, like, the consistent guys out of everything. And then we got this magic power down here called irrigation. And so I was talking to a few uh, rain-fed farmers earlier, 
And in a year like last year, you know, if you hit 600 or 800 kgs per hectare in a field, that was pretty decent. Um, irrigation, we can blow that out of the water. So let's look a little closer. So up in Sarda, 116 frost-free days. Solstice, 17 hours, 41 minutes. That's like, they get like six hours of night to sleep in the middle of summer there, right? Uh, in a tech, similar. What happens down here? We're an hour and a half less day, daylight in, in the growing season, in the middle of the growing season in southern Alberta. And that's pretty significant. And so that's one of the reasons why they're looking more at the, the fiber side of things. But we've got this awesome thing with our 124 frost-free days. I'm sure a couple of years past here, we've had like 150 in some cases. So uh, we're doing awesome that way. So if, if we're going to kind of compare these things, I thought I'd throw overlay the heat units on here. So Sarda and Initech are hitting like 1,800, 2,000 corn heat units. We're hitting like 2,200, 2,400 maybe down in southern Alberta. So that's going to have some implications for what we can do with our hemp. So then I'm over, going to overlay a bunch more things here. So we've had a couple fiber and processing facilities not happen in southern Alberta, um, but they are happening in other parts of the province. So in Bruderheim, Canadian Rockies Hemp Corp, Vagerville's obviously got their decortication facility, uh, Drayton Valley's got this biocomposites group, and then Hembelta within Calgary. And then there's also a couple proposed ones. I know Darcy's working uh, with the group in Flair. There's one popped up in Grand Prairie and then in Vagerville. So all in all, we're pretty unrepresented in southern Alberta uh, within this hemp space. Uh, although there is like a few other outfits like, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, where they do the CBD oil extraction and stuff like that. So we've got usually the frost-free period. We have run up against this a couple times. This is uh, when we have later harvested hemp. We've had snowfall of a foot in September, which isn't a huge deal. The hemp can tolerate all the moisture and other things. What it can't handle is these 100 kilometer hour winds for three days afterwards while that snow dries out. So if we're gonna look at hemp fiber, what are the things that we need for good quality hemp fiber? Well, the taller it is, the more fiber we're gonna get. Uh, we need harvest timing is obviously really critical. We don't want it wrapping around. We need the right equipment. And then we want the right ratios of male-female and things like that in our bale. We want high quality. I, from what I understood, a lot of hemp bales have been turned away lately, especially the organic side. Processors don't want to take them. That's because there's just too many weeds um, and other byproducts and things, and, and they, they lose that, um, that premium or whatever uh, that, you, that you'd want within your, your side. We can also look at harvest index. And so... Harvest index is just seed yield divided by the, the total biomass. Uh, if you've got a really high harvest index, that means you've got a lot of grain for the biomass. If you're growing for grain, that's what you want. You look at something like potatoes, really high harvest index. If you look at something like growing a fiber crop, you have a really low harvest index. And then we can look at um, kind of the male-female ratio. So, Within hemp, we've got monoecious and dioecious. And so typically, the grain or dual purpose varieties will be dioecious. They'll so have a separate male and a separate female plant. So the male plant's on the far left there, and that's going to have all the pollen sacs. And what's amazing is how many, different, how many ways we can affect the male-female ratio and the expression of males and females within the hemp based on the agronomic things that we do. So for instance, in our seeding date trials, you know, typically it takes 30 days to maturity, 40 days to, or not to maturity, to, uh, to flowering for the, to see those male pollens start to, to come on the hemp plant. If we plant really, really early in southern Alberta, it might take 60 days. Um, we can also look a little closer at these monoecious varieties. And so typically the tall fiber varieties are monoecious. Sometimes they can be predominantly male or predominantly female, again, based on stress and other factors, and that'll have implications into our quality as well. So I'm going to take a peek um, at kind of with the, the framework of this uh, hemp fiber. Uh, hemp, or Yan is the one here uh, now, not just our guru. Uh, so we've been running this matrix trial for quite a number of years. Uh, we've got four staple crops. We've got wheat, barley, canola, and peas. And then we've been overlaying hemp and quinoa and some other novel, novel crops within there. And we're doing 
two, two, three two-year studies looking specifically at emergence and biomass and, and yield and weed, uh, weeds, uh, weed biomass and things like that. So just a quick picture of how those look. So this is our typical four-year small plot rotation to give you a feel for how many small plots we typically fit in. This trial takes up that entire four-year space plus all those small plots. So these are about four times the size of our typical small plot trials. And so this is just showing on the one side the big blocks to start, and then the tractor comes over in year two, so the left side there is year two, and we get our 81, nine times nine, 81 different uh, permutations and combinations, and then four reps of all of those. And so it's really awesome is it gives us a really good handle on what, what crops we should see before hemp and after hemp. Um, this is just showing you, is that working? Showing you that. So we put, yeah. So here's what they look like in, I think this picture was from Sarda this year. They had very low precipitation compared to what they're used to. What's impressive is that despite some of the pretty poor looking spring wheats, canola peas, whatever other things, hemp still looks really green, fairly vigorous, even if the stand is a little low and thin. And it's pretty impressive to look at. Oh, sorry, I was on the wrong, wrong picture. This is the picture. Okay. So next slide. So I've presented this before on quinoa. The same thing holds true um, for our hemp crop. So we only got 36% emergence on our barley. Uh, 40, I think that should say 43, sorry. I put 34. Uh, 44 in quinoa, 41% in wheat, 49% dry beans, 40 canola, corn 14. We did not get any good emergence on it from our hemp on corn. Uh, peas 40 and hemp 36. And so, you know, if I overlay a graph of all this, anytime the bar goes down, that's a bad thing. That's below our kind of norm or average. Anytime it goes up is good. And so, so Durham makes a great precursor crop um, in terms of establishment. Uh, peas and quinoa as well, although quinoa introduces a host of other weed and other problems like that. So, One thing we found within these trials over and over again, and this is having, again, those implications for, uh, for fiber processing, if you look in there, you've got a really kind of ugly looking plot part way through, and I think it's probably hidden back in, in there somewhere where you can't see it in this picture. And it shows even more so in a dry year. So this is taken this year from Inatech. They had a really dry year. Nothing is different about these crops except the rotation. On the right-hand side is canola for all those crops. Canola as a precursor crop. On the left-hand side is faba beans. Nothing else is different. The fertility, the seeding date, everything is exactly the same. And so, you know, that uh, volunteer canola problem is even exacerbated um, in a, in a dry year specifically. And the other challenge is our typical herbicide options for hemp is edge pre-seed, which is uh, registered for canola, so it's not gonna do anything for us. Um, there is, for, for um, grassy weeds, there's a couple options, um, but most of them, wild oats, uh, we end up with resistant wild oats for most of them, and so that's starting to be an issue as well. So we'll hopefully be looking at that in the future. And then I pulled this from a different study this is just showing the weed biomass, and this is something that they had done in Vagerville. Um, and it's just showing on another study, early, normal, and late. And so if we're not careful about our planting date, uh, we could end up with, with weed implications there. So another picture of the drought in 2021. I mean, crops looked abysmal across Alberta, let's be honest, any rain-fed crops. However, I'm still impressed how green and, and the yields we got despite of things. I mean, there were some crops that were a complete... Uh, write-off, and I wouldn't go as far as to say as the hemp, I don't think, in many cases, was a write-off. And so that's kind of inspiring. So now we're going to get a little crazy. It's a good thing there's no, no hemp growers in here. Um, we're looking at some correlations, and we were playing with the data, and I presented a lot of this over and over again, so I thought, well, what kind of crazy things are we seeing, and maybe what does that mean, and, you know, what kind of things can we draw? And so we're going we're gonna to hone this in. Uh, we'll see which of this stuff makes sense. So it's just being, this is kind of a caution, you know. If, if you see a correlation, it doesn't necessarily imply causation. And uh, in, in some cases, it will be a reasonable explanation. You know, obviously in the Bieber example, it, it makes no sense. 
So here's some pictures from our fertility plots. On the left, we've got zero kgs per hectare. And we go 50 kgs per hectare, 100 kgs per hectare, and 150 kgs per hectare. That's percent of recommended nitrogen and phosphorus. And so uh, you can see a pretty nice bar chart in the, in the field, which is awesome. We've also got a number of other treatments. So we looked at split apps. We added UAN four weeks and eight weeks, and both four weeks and eight weeks after seeding. And then we had another treatment. We, we did uh, ATP product, uh, foliar kinetic boron, I think. Uh, so if we look at, I rank these from best to worst yield. We don't have all the stats finished yet. Uh, but if we, we rank them, we see on the far side, untreated check, 50% N, even 100% N, not the best yields. Um, from doing this enough, I can tell you that the, the two on the end there are probably statistically significant. As we go further up, the, the likelihood or the significance is going to be a lot, a lot less. And then we can start to overlay a couple interesting things too and say, you know, well, why is this? What is, what is happening? And so, you know, we were looking at some different things. So, so head height, so we measured our stem height, our head height, our total height, things like that. So head height is pretty correlated. I mean, it makes sense. The bigger your head, the more grain yield you're probably gonna have. And we've seen, um, you know, we've seen that in, in these crops. What is this one? Um, so now we're looking at grain, hemp yield for phenola and salacea. And I'm just trying to, I can't read it. I made it too small. Oh yeah, okay, now we're looking at the male females. And so what's interesting is that in response to stress, oftentimes they'll have a different expression. And what will often happen is, is when the hemp is stressed, you'll get a lot more males. And it, it kind of just seems counterintuitive, but the hemp really wants to make sure it survives. And so it'll end up having more males um, than females. And so under those untreated checks, uh, so this is where it's kind of counterintuitive to me. So under those untreated checks, 50% and other things, that lower numbers are failed female to male ratio. So that's actually telling me we're, we're having more females than males. So not totally sure what's going on there yet, but uh, that's kind of interesting. So now this is a total table summary of all those treatments for uh, Sarda Inatech and Farming Smarter. On the top, we've got the biomass. This is the tons per hectare, and this is kind of the, the number we're going to look at for, for processing fiber bales and stuff like that. And then on the bottom is the grain yield. Uh, so I have combined, uh, oh no, I've got the phenol and salacea are separate, which, which we did because typically you're growing the salacea for fiber, and typically you're growing the phenola for grain. So a couple interesting things I just wanted to point out. At the Sarda sites, we had really, really low fiber biomass uh, for the phenola, which is great. That's what you want. It's going to make harvesting easy. Um, but they still had pretty reasonable yields. So that's a great thing. That's, that means your harvest index is right where you want it to be. And uh, that's a really good thing. At Inatech, they had pretty reasonable uh, fiber yields. Uh, 10 and 8.1 tons per hectare. And considering that they've had to deal with some lack of moisture and other things, you can see 5.9 in 2021 from the drought. They're still doing reasonably well, and they're, they're not irrigated site. And then, like I said, their, their grain yields seem to be pretty, um, pretty consistent as well. And then when we look at the Farming Smarter site, you know, our salacea under irrigation, we can get some huge fiber yields. And we were out there and you got some giant Christmas trees and some big, tall, you know, palm tree looking things that we're, we're harvesting for biomass. And look at that, that's our grain yields down there. So we can get some really significant grain yields under irrigation. So we're gonna look at some of the specifics within there. And so I'm gonna jump to another trial now. This is our seeding rate by date trial. So we combined, you know, what do we know about seeding dates? Earlier is probably better for us. And what do we know about seeding rates? Well, higher rates, like 400 seeds per meter squared, that's what you want for a fiber crop because you're gonna want that consistency within your straw and you're just gonna wanna make sure everything's quite uniform, easier to handle, bale process. You don't want big, you don't want big giant Christmas trees when you're going in cutting and, and baling. 
But on the grain end, you know, maybe there's, uh, you know, you look at all the canola guys going two pounds an acre and under irrigation and using planters and other things like that. So maybe there's an argument to be made for dropping seeding rates from the typical 250 seeds per meter squared. We went all the way down to 100. And so, yeah, so this picture is just showing this was our normal seeding date. On the left, we've got 400 seeds per meter squared, 250, and then 100 seeds per meter squared. And I just took the photo like this, and you can see how different those crops look. And this is the two extremes of the trial. So the far left, that's 100 seeds per meter squared seeded as early as we possibly could. And then on the far right is 400 seeds per meter squared seeded as late as we possibly could. So you just see the complete contrast between the plots there. Um, for us, early, normal, and late are different than in Inatech, and they're different than Sarda. Our early date, they're not even able to get in the field, usually up north. Um, so, so for us, we're aiming for that first week of May for an early seed. And that's what we'd call an early seeding date. And that's why when they said, um, when Jan first told us seed after the May long weekend, it was like, well, that's, that's late for us. We're trying to wrap up everything that we're doing by May long weekend. And that's our normal date. And then our late date's in June, which is like, it doesn't even feel right to be seeding in June around here, right? So, so we got a couple interesting things to look at. So, you know, we took measurements on, again, those heights. We did stem diameters. So if we look at the seeding dates, was there a difference? Or was the stem diameter different for those different seeding dates? Not really. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe a really small. It makes sense. Later might be smaller, but the hemp, the hemp crops have actually compensated pretty good. So that's just looking at Salacia and, and Lethbridge here. Uh, but then the seeding rates, that really had the effect. And I mean, that makes sense. You could see by the differences in those two plots how much different a hemp crop is going to behave or a hemp plant is going to behave when it has all that room to grow. And so it does a lot of interesting things that way. So I kind of adapted this next slide from our another study we had done, but this is looking at total biomass. So that light green section, that is the stem height from the ground all the way up to where the head starts. And then the dark green section, that's the height of the stem. And you can see a couple interesting things. So the first is that our lower seeding rate had bigger heads. And I, I think we saw that within the plots there pretty obviously. And the other one was we had at our earliest seeding dates is also when we had the biggest heads. So bigger heads, probably bigger yield. And then we overlaid the stem diameter with that. I don't know why, just to, just to show you, I guess, that at the, the lower seeding rates, we got bigger stem diameters. At the higher seeding rates, lower. I mean, it only makes sense. So we got some really cool things going on here now with, oops, the male-female ratios. I should have made those bigger. Um, so up at the top, that's our phenola. And those are our grain yields based on either the factor of the seeding rate or the seeding date. So the top left, that's our seeding rates. And we haven't really seen a big impact on seeding yield. But what's interesting is how much difference in expression of male and female plants we were getting. And so um, potentially, maybe some of the reason that we're not seeing those differences is because of that expression of those plants. So you have more female plants from phenola, you're going to get more grain yield. So even on the low end of 100 seeds per meter squared, if you're getting more females from those 100 plants, you're actually going to boost your uh, grain yields up a little bit. And I wouldn't expect it to go up with the 400 there too, but it, it does for some reason. So maybe that's some other weird thing we don't know. And then on, on the right-hand side, you can look at early, normal, and late. And again, you can see that for in southern Alberta here, uh, we're getting a little better grain yield the earlier we go. Sometimes normal, and then late is typically our lowest. Although we still get really good yields even when we plant in June. And, and that's one thing I, I kind of wanted to highlight both those points is that, you know, the earlier does seem to be better for us, but also the late isn't terrible. It's not like other crops where you try and plant in mid-June mid and you don't get anything. We still get pretty reasonable yields out of a, a June seeded hemp crop. And I've got these two to scale now. So now we're looking at uh, male, female again. Okay, uh, we're just looking at the biomass now. So we'll focus on the bottom two graphs. So that's the salacia and that's our tons per hectare again. And so higher seeding rate, we're actually getting higher tons per hectare with salacia, which makes a lot of sense. And that's probably good for our, our management choices. And then if you look in the bottom right, our, this is where I was a little 
wonky, whereas actually our early timings weren't giving us as much biomass. And I, I think potentially we haven't harvested those early ones early enough to, to level out with the normal. Um, and we're also seeing, yeah, I think it's pretty interesting anyway. So I want to go back to kind of summarizing these now in context of each of the locations. And so if we go up to Sarda, who, uh, Megan is there now, and we look at the yields, I'm going to rank these, I just rank them highest to lowest. And you see I got normal, normal seeding rate, normal seeding rate, late seeding rate, late seeding rate, early seeding rate. That doesn't make any sense to me here. But for some reason, their normal seeding rates are getting their best yields. And I, I think that's because they've got so much snow melt and other things to worry about in the springtime. They've got a lot colder soils than us when they first go in and they can first get in that field and start punching hemp in. And so hemp is pretty weak kind of seed. I mean, it's easy to grow probably in your basement. I don't know. But um, it's like it doesn't do well in those cold soils, and it, it, it doesn't like being waterlogged. And I think they deal a lot more with that in central and northern Alberta than we worry about here. We're usually the opposite. We can't wait to turn some irrigation on, on our crops. And so we've seen that with the seed yield from Fenola. And then the seed yield from the Salacia variety as well. And so normal, 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 late, late, early, late, early. I mean, it's completely counterintuitive to what I would think, but it's important distinction to make. And so in a tech, same thing. So their phenola crop, um, their, their phenola is kind of all over the place. And like I said, they're, they're a lot more consistent. Their range is only, you know, 1,000 or 100 uh, kgs a hectare there. So I'm pretty sure none of these sites are really going to be uh, statistically different than one another. And then within their Salacia, um, you know, kind of normal was the best. Um, actually early and then late, but again, not a huge range, a couple hundred kgs a hectare for them. Here's where things get a little crazy for us in southern Alberta. So, you know, our Fenola yields over the last three years, way, way higher, right? Like in that 2,000 kgs a hectare range. I've, we've had a couple trials and plots go higher, but uh, we'll speculate on that later. So early seeding rate, 100 seeds per meter squared. Apparently early 400, normal 250, early 250, normal, normal, and then late, late, late. And those are, you know, five, 600 kgs per hectare lower now by planting late. Um, again, the seeding rates aren't making the big difference, but that timing is for us. And then same with Salacia. Even, even though our overall yields are way lower for Salacia, um, our grain yields, Anyways, um, still the early timings are giving us more grain yield. What am I doing for time? Just about up. Cut it off. Okay. Well, I'll summarize our precision pulse trials. We did some. Uh, Gabir was talking about the planter yesterday, and we got this beautiful photo. And really what we've seen is, is because hemp is so adaptable, because it can, it'll change that male-female ratio, because the heads compensate, because so many things go on, we haven't seen big differences by planting with a planter. It's, it's an awesome. You can do it. And using the planter gave us a little better emergence and other things, but in terms of uh, yield and, and fertility effects and other things with the planter, um, we're happy with it. Haven't seen any, you know, big breakthroughs that way. I will skip ahead then, and we'll go back to kind of where we first started, what we know, what we think, and where we're at. So now I'm the guru. Um, so, so hemp establishment, you know, we've got influences by stubble, moisture, soil temperatures. Um, again, still not heavily impacted by um, insects or diseases. So um, grain quality, um, really important, or quantity, I suppose, yield, um, affected by seeding date for us down here. Um, fiber yields correlated with our stem diameters, our male-female ratios, all sorts of other factors. And, you know, it, it really does matter, um, you know, what you're doing to get that good quality. And one of the things is, we'll get to that in a second, I guess. All right, so very first thing is, we just need edge, cultivate, prep. Well, I mean, it's a good strategy. It's almost universally effective, except it doesn't work well for our volunteer canola. It doesn't get our wild oats. Not, not great on wild buckwheat either. But almost everything else uh, we do a pretty good job of. Seeded after the May long weekend. Well, in central Alberta, probably fine. Northern Alberta, probably fine. Southern Alberta, I don't know. I think I'd rather get my, uh, my seeding done before we go camping, for sure. 
Uh, hemp doesn't need a lot of fertilizer. Well, yeah, it sure knows how to use it, I think. So, um, you know, aren't really any herbicides? Yeah, nope. There's, there's still a, maybe a few minor use things to do. We're going to look at potentially doing some avidex and other things for that wild oak control. Uh, but nothing, you know, nothing happening just yet. Not any pest problems? No, didn't even have to worry. No, no pest problems in 10 years, really. Um, maybe some sclerotinia, but it hasn't been like, it hasn't been knocking down yields and things like in canola. Um, will it outcompete the weeds? Like I said, almost universally. And hemp is a double threat crop. Well, it's actually like a quadruple threat crop, but as you've seen, it really depends on what you're trying to grow. And so we've got feed food, fiber, and fractions. And you can, you really kind of got to pick one and then all the rest is just gravy. You can get one or two other things out. You can grow for, for grain, and if you get a little fiber, or if a country or a company comes in and contracts your CBD, that's just gravy. You, you really can't, because they're so different, you can't try and grow them for all four things at the same time. So thanks very much. That uh, The third picture there is a little mystery thing we had on one of our plots. And so if anybody can identify that, I think there's a shoehorn prize for you if you can let us know what that has been driving us crazy. And so special thanks to Sarda Inatech, CHDA, Manitoba Harvest, and especially uh, Canadian Agricultural Partnership. You know, we do have a few hemp growers in the room, or maybe some who are considering mm -hmm. hemp. Uh, any questions for Mike at all? One over here. Uh, Mike, just a quick question on as dry as it was last year, what did you see the moisture draw down in the soil? Is there anything left after? Oh, that, that I'm not sure, yeah. Um, it, it was definitely dry. Like I said, like I toured up through Inatech and up to the piece, and you know, most, a lot of stuff looked like it was write-offs. Like there was some plots and other stuff. It was just, you know, that's going to go five, ten bushels. And so the fact that we got like five, six hundred kgs on some of the hemp plots is pretty impressive. But, um, yeah, I think our reserves here are not looking great. I, I know that. So did it take all the reserves even out of those northern areas too for the soil? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know if it's because hemp is better at using the water or just, you know, it grows like a weed and so it's like anything else it just gets green and robust mm -hmm. uh yeah question at the back go ahead sure uh for us hemp neophytes uh what's the conversion from kilograms per hectare to bushels oh uh 44 pounds a bushel so um yeah uh, follow-up <coughs> question for me uh, madam chair uh, question about water use efficiency what do you think uh per bushels per inch, or is there, is there some rule of thumb in the, in the expert head on the bus? Oh, not in, not in my head right now. It put me on the spot. That's a, that's a Google question. <laughs> well, you're better than Google. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Some future research mm -hmm. potential on that one. Okay, any other questions? All right, let us thank Guru Mike for having us today.